They say that change is the only constant in life. In this season of Swim Upstream, we're breaking down specific instances of change in software organizations when both technical and human aspects were involved. Basha Mucha is a director of engineering at Compass, a US-based real estate brokerage meets tech stack. Fun fact about Compass, there are over 1,000 engineers building their platform. Welcome, Basha. My pleasure to speak with you too. All right, let's dive in. Let's kick things off with some warm-up questions. So what have you been listening to on Spotify? So due to COVID, mostly I work from home and I have a toddler at home. So I feel like every morning it's either wheel on a bus or run, baby, run. <laughs> I am sure many people could refer to this when they have toddlers. So I don't have as many songs like I used to. So it's all toddler songs now. Yeah. Uh, what about the ba baby shark song? Is that I can't remember what the... <laughs> Yeah, there is definitely Baby Shark, too. Okay. My kid sings videos on the bus every morning now. <laughs> okay. So tell us a bit about where you are, were, when the story that we're going to focus on happened. Okay, so I have started a compass as a senior manager in the data platform organization. Um, now I am the director of engineering and transaction management. So I kind of moved teams from big kind of many datas of listings into the transaction world of Compass. Um, Compass is like a leading technology enabled residential real estate broker, providing an end to end platform for the agents to deliver exceptional services to sellers and buyers. Um, so I grew further and further into Compass throughout the years. So I know a lot of people in the US at least uh, know Compass and but not necessarily as a software company. Like, uh, do, do, do you know how many software developers there are on, on, in Compass at the moment? Yeah, so there are over a thousand um, software developers at Compass. Um, all are in different parts all over the US, a lot in the East Coast and West Coast. We also have three India offices and we have contractors all over the country from Argentina, China, Ukraine, and India. Okay, that sounds big. Hopefully, uh, your employees are, uh, in Ukraine are okay. Um, so you saw the R&D organization grow times 10 and in a pretty short time frame. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. I think I joined when it was, I forgot it was Series E or like we had so many series and then we went IPO about a year ago. I think it was a couple of days ago. We had our anniversary. Um, definitely grew significantly. A lot of this happened during COVID. Did it feel like there were more and more names in the Slack channel? but Or was it also that you were meeting all these new people all the time? At the beginning, I joined right before COVID. So you would um, meet a lot of new people. For example, we all opened our Seattle office and we had people fly in from Seattle to meet us. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. Um, at that time, it was only engineers in New York and mostly in Seattle. Um, when we went remote of COVID, um, you know, Compass didn't know what to expect from the market. It definitely was a positive thing from Compass um, during COVID, but we weren't expecting as many, you know, the markets changing as, you know, people are outbidding each other. About six months into COVID, then we started hiring significantly. And at the beginning was, do we hire remote? Do we not? And we tried our remote. You saw more people on Slack. You were interviewing all virtually. How do you interview, you know, higher? And then it just started growing, growing significantly during the COVID times. We covered the personal angle. What was the, the situation from a Compass angle? Yeah, so Compass has created kind of like a best-in-class platform for agents, including search, marketing, CRM. It also achieved significant market share. Um, we were just ranked number one in the U.S. real estate market with $251 billion in sale volumes in 2021. Um, so we had to extend the platform end-to-end. -end, um, and this is where transaction management has evolved. Um, basically, in the past, certain transactions were paid out manually by operational so it made sense to build this end-to-end -end platform for time to pay, for reporting, and to reduce the operational cost. 
In addition, Compass acquired Glide, which is a transaction management platform for external um, agents or other clients. It sounds like you're adding new capabilities, but also maybe adding something that has a different type of character to the company, right? To And also to the R&D organization? Yes. Yeah, so as I'm not sure if many people know about real estate, but many things in the real estate happen manually or using many third-party tools. For example, offers is all paperwork. Then, you know, compliance is all the brokers have to have skin documents for like auditing purposes. And then there's also like commission to pay the agents. Um, not many brokerages have created an end-to-end platform for that. And it makes it easier for agents to do their job and be kind of like entrepreneur because they could see everything in one system versus logging into multiple systems um, of like what Armour offers would be a separate system. In order to get paid, I have to log into a separate system, et cetera. It sounds like you're offering something great. So is there a challenge um, from a technical standpoint, from a business standpoint? Definitely, there are many challenges. Um, Every region has different legal aspects or different requirements and features. Um, For example, in California, the agents get paid at table. In the East Coast, more uncentered, they could get paid, you know, one to two days later, even further, depending on when they submit their payments. Some regions have legalities of there has to be an order in between or a broker that approves it. Some regions don't. So the platform is not just like Instagram, Facebook, where you give it to the users and expand the market. You have to build each region differently. And as Compass expands, you have to figure out research in that region. Are there any legal differences and continue expanding this platform? So I guess with smaller companies, they might like uh, startups just starting off, they might have the luxury of being able to focus only on one geography and maybe life is simpler. It sounds like you were growing very fast. I I guess expectations were high. So the rate in which you had to absorb these new geographies probably was very high, right? Yes. And we are still in the process of releasing this end-to-end transaction management to all regions. We're 50% there and hopefully to be 100% somewhere in Q3 of this year. So does this mean that the product needs to behave differently in different geographies or is it just something like different in the database only? So both. Um, It is different sometimes in database because there's different aspects like I talked about. There's an auditor, so you might have to have an auditor flag or there's a broker approver and there's different features. One example is in certain features for compliance purposes, let's say there's a listing agreement. In the first regions we went out, it's one listing agreement. In other regions, there's amendments and there's like a multi-doc upload. How do you build those features? And usually when we build a feature, we try to release to all regions if it makes sense. Or we only enable it for those regions if it's specifically legal aspects and it will just make the other regions more complicated versus better. This sounds like something that's even hard to grasp for like one person understanding the entirety of the complexity of that. So, I mean, how do you go about doing something like that? How do you teach an organization how to to move forward that way? Yes. So how we did that is we collaborated with Run Region to start about a year and a half ago, which was Florida. We gathered all the requirements from Florida, built the MVP released what we call early access of 200 agents in Florida, got the feedback, iterated, and then released all of Florida. Then we go to the next region as engineers of building Florida, product and research goes to the next regions, start demoing what you have in the region previously, gather more requirements on that and build that and continue on and on and on. And of course, as the platform is there, there's always going to be agents that want to have new features or ideas. So product and engineering has to work very closely of what region do we release next or do we build out features that agents or staff want for all of the regions that we release to. Okay, so you're doing this one by one. That's very convenient. It gives you like the focus you need each time, but is that good enough in terms of speed? Well, definitely um, not always, right? There's an aspect of, you know, releasing and also growing the team. 
originally about a year and a half ago, we started out being a very small team uh, learning about Florida. And then we hired and kind of divided the teams into multiple subflow teams. Um, so therefore, we could move much faster from region to region. So you could have groups of people working not just on one region. You could have three or four regions getting built out at the same time, but by different engineers. And like, do different engineers focus on different geographies at that point? So we divided the teams based on the flow of originally entering the data, um, then doing the compliance and commission. And in those teams, different team members might work on different regions, but the team members should understand what the other regions um, features are for on-call process or in case there are issues, you can't rely one engineer, one engineer to engineers knowing one region because you don't want to have, you know, one person being the um, one point of failure in a way. So we do have to knowledge transfer a lot of the data to many engineers and team. Basically, it sounds like you're creating different versions of the same product. Now, let's say you're in the fifth version. And now someone in the product comes up with this great idea that could be implemented for the last four. It seems like anytime you add another version, it becomes harder and harder to add new features because you need to go back and, and start remembering, okay, what happened there? And does that even work there? And what do we need to do? And so on. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Um, so as we are building features, of course, with any company startup, you're going to have a lot of refactoring or backfilling the data where necessary. So at the beginning, I think we moved very, very fast and we're still moving fast, but sometimes you do have to slow down and understand why did we do things a certain way in the past, how we're going to do it, what makes sense, how we're going to restructure either the database, the microservices, are we going to split them and then, you know, enable that feature behind um, what we call feature flags. We try to implement our code where everything works the way it is. We enable it for a couple users, then see if it's six and then start migrating the rest of the deals or users onto the new feature. It sounds like there's a lot of knowledge about reasons like this we did because of that. And because we did that, we, we changed this. So where, where does all that live? And how do you make sure that you have it on hand when you need it? So um, one, of course, product and research has to be very strong and documentation has to be more or less up to date. Every company I've worked on, always documentation is never up to date. We try to keep our documentation as close as possible. And a lot of it, I think, is in our heads, to be very honest. Um, so people that have been here longer try to give that knowledge to others. And as we promote certain engineers to lead, um, the longer you're here, the more knowledge you have. And, you know, we all have like open Slack groups where in case there's a question that somebody doesn't remember, anybody from multiple teams could answer that and give reasons of like, why was it done this way? And then we go through that process. OK, what should we do now? So we do have weekly meetings, um, discussions of certain regions and certain features to make sure we're all aligned. So now I'm assuming that you're adding more, uh, more geographies and so on. And you, maybe you think back at how you started and you think, wow, we really should have done this differently or this would have been faster and so on. Are, are there, is there anything like substantial that you would change, go back and change? So Compass has been around for quite a while, but I don't think they put that much engineering resources on their transaction management. And if I could go back, you know, let's say I was in Compass, you know, five years ago versus three years ago, this started about two years ago building. I would say, let's build as much earlier. We would we had a lot less regions we were out in. It would have been easier and learn from it. We started this process where we've been already very successful as a brokerage, but had to do a lot of manual stuff. Um, so, it, you know, I think these things have been brought up by like leadership, had ideas of other things for Compass. There was many products in Compass. They didn't concentrate on transaction management. So if we did it earlier, we might have been already much more successful at this point. Okay. Yeah. So building the knowledge and infrastructure in advance. Now, if someone is 
in a different company that's already mature and now creating this new business line, this new offering from scratch. Do you have like any important pointers for someone in that situation, what they should look out for, how they should prepare? Yes, I think I kind of pointed out is, you know, these region or legal nuances um, in real estate is very hard. So how do you gather all of the requirements? Um, Compass, I think, did a very good job from product and research where they did the thing called learn from reality, another like principle they have, where they went out into the world and understand in different companies, what do agents have? What are agents feedback? And try to gather all those requirements. You know, there's some requirements that we missed. There's requirements that we misunderstood. Um, maybe better communication with product and engineering and like iterating on that. Like the longer time you have an iteration, the easier it is. If you're trying to like move very fast, it, you're gonna, there's going to be mistakes that happen. And then we have to like rebuild it. So invest a lot in proper research and also move gradually. Yeah. And invest in your people too, right? If you kind of, when I went through, you know, engineer starting as a startup, you know, you can't keep engineers at the same level. How do you invest in the people? Some people want to be tech leads. Some people want to be managers. So the longer people are in the company, I think the more knowledge they have and they could drive a certain way. But you also want new people to come in and give you new ideas. Because if you work too long, you're kind of like in your own box and maybe you don't think outside the box. So it's like a nice balance of new people and people that have the knowledge to figure out like the next steps. How do you imagine this looking like, what do you imagine this looking like uh, at Compass like a few years from now? Now it's all constantly changing. You haven't added all the geographies yet. What is it going to look like a few years from now? Yes, I see this kind of like in two parts. By the end of this year, we're going to have a hundred billions of dollars going through this transaction management platform. And agents are going to be delighted in driving adoption and other parts of the Compass platform integrating with it. Um, down the line is how do we make this platform external for usage outside of Compass and for clients? Um, I think that's kind of a North Star, but when will we get there? And will non-Compass agents actually be okay using this platform? Because, you know, there's different brokerages. Do they come on board to Compass and maybe we get more agents or does this become external where other brokerage companies could use it too? Cool. So it sounds like there are already things to research now. And there's also like, the, there's many things. There are so there... many features, like there's so many ideas that people have. I could see like almost like a two, three year plan for this platform. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on. No problem. Thank you so much. For the last episode of the season, we brought in our very own swim band, the Sultans of Swim, who you can hear playing in the background. Head to our Instagram page for some photos from the recording session. Thanks everyone for tuning in. That's all the time we have for today. To read episode transcripts, check out our past season, suggest an episode, or join our growing community of developers, head to swim.io. That's swim with two M's dot IO.